Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking. Uh, I'm Gary Ann, of course. <laughs> I've got a Jared. I've got a Mike. I also have a Dada. Hi, Dada. And uh, Jared, how uh, you had an exciting week. Neither one of us were here last week. I know. So we're both really excited to be we're here. Both like we're <laughs> back, baby. <laughs> so. Like that. Uh, yeah. So um, what were what were you doing? Was uh, I was just you know standing in the shadow of the moon for two minutes. <laughs> As you do. No big deal. NBD. So yeah. Uh, you went to it says Detroit. I blocked out of Detroit Lake. Mi Oregon, not Michigan. Oh, so, darn. Yes. Turns out there's more than one Detroit, yeah. which confused a lot of people when I said I'm going to the Detroit for the eclipse. For the totality. And people were like, why, why? are you going to Detroit? <laughs> That's a terrible idea. And I was like, oh, well, you know, it's where the shadow is. So. That's so great. I mean, thank you, by the way, for the uh, eclipse glasses. You're welcome. There How's are... that looking? Yeah. Ew. I, I, I mean, I guess you're going to have to tell me because I can't see <laughs> Jack with these things on. Good. They're working. Yeah. No, that was that was so. great. I also really appreciated that these are Daystar filters. Mm -hmm. uh, that made me laugh quite that's a right. bit. So, uh, as Ben likes to call the sun the Daystar. Yeah. That's why I figured you guys might like those eclipse glasses. Yeah. So. It's <laughs> very, Ben's very little cool. joke. It's an actual company name. <laughs> so, so now that every so time perfect. Ben makes that joke, he's got to throw a nickel at Daystar filters. Oh, so. crap. Sorry, Ben. Great. So. Oops. Oh, well. Uh, that's that's funny. Uh, I myself was not doing anything nearly as interesting. I, I went to a really fabulous bridal shower, so that's why I wasn't here. So uh, there's that. But uh, Mr. Mike, how, how, are you, how are you feeling outside of your box? How did that go last I'm week? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So on the way to the studio last uh, week, I just uh, had all of my data compressed inside of my hollow emitter, and we just shipped it over. But I decided to do something different on my way back, and I left it on going through the airport and just, you know, was acting like a regular person, and no one seemed to notice. So it was great, and I've been doing lots of work, and there's been... So many interesting things that's been happening in the space industry. So I'm really <laughs> excited to talk about it. Oh my goodness, so good. Okay, so uh, I know some of you are wondering what, what is cluttering up our news desk here. And we will be getting that, to that much later, actually in After Dark. So for those of you uh, who are tuning in live, congratulations, you'll get to see it first. And uh, those of you who will be joining us a little bit later for After Dark, then you'll get to see what that is. So, uh, but... On today's Orbit 10.31, we've actually got, are talking a lot about a lot of different things coming together in a lot of different ways between launches, eclipses, astronauts, and taikonauts, as well as our guest this week, Bob Walker, is going to be talking with Ben about the National Space Council. So here we go. Welcome to tomorrow. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? All right, before we get started, started, I definitely want to make sure we give a thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. These are the Escape Velocity patrons. These people have given us $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode. They, of course, get access to our Discord channel and all the craziness that comes out of that. And there's also some new <laughs> rewards. So if you're interested in what those are, what you're getting now, or what you could be getting, head on over to patreon.com <laughs> slash T-M-R-O. Oh, my awesome. goodness. All right, so... As we always like to start off the show, if we can, we have some launches. So, uh, Mr. Vine. And we can this week. No, no. <laughs> Tell us what's that, what happened. What did I miss us this, between last week and this week? All right. So, uh, this week, uh, we had two launches. And the first one was actually from my favorite company, SpaceX. And this happened on Thursday, August 24th. So, let's go ahead and check out the Five, footage of that. Four, three, two, one. Put down the top of that. As I said, this launch took place on Thursday and happened at 1851 Coordinated Universal Time. And you might notice the launch pad looked a little bit different. That was actually Launch Complex 4 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And I love that shot with the crosshairs. I don't think I've ever seen the crosshairs on that before, and I actually kind of like it. 
But in any case, after liftoff, the Falcon 9 rocket turned south to place the payload into uh, an eventual 720 kilometer high orbit that is in a sun synchronous orbit. The payload was Formosat 5, one in a series of Earth imaging satellites for Taiwan. And this was the first one that was actually designed, built, and tested by Taiwan. And afterwards, the first stage separation, uh, after separation, was able to land back at their Pacific drone ship, just read the instructions. Although camera footage did cut out right before, and I just really love how the, uh, the host, uh, uh, Lauren Lyons, put it for uh, this uh, particular launch on that. You'll hear the audio come back for that in just a second. But with this uh, uh, landing, they were able to successfully land for the 15th time. Ah, uh, and it looks like we lost the camera feed. Oh, wait, there we go. <laughs> It's still a little spotty, but we're still getting great footage of that, so congratulations. And also here's, the, of course, the payload deployment, so congratulations to everyone at SpaceX and all the people involved in Taiwan for making this mission possible. And one thing that I did want to mention about this is SpaceX actually lost a bit of money on this launch because this particular mission was supposed to launch on uh, the Falcon 1E, which uh, SpaceX decided not to pursue. And uh, with this launch, they lost out on quite a bit of money, but this is a huge thing. I mean, I'm really proud of the company for keeping their promises and taking that loss in order to have that customer assurance and not raising the price that they originally paid. So that was really, really cool. And I just thought that was worth mentioning. I was going to say, I, I didn't actually miss this one. I, I was, in fact, uh, watching this particular one. And uh, <laughs> I think, you know, we always, uh, in the space industry, we kind of get used to some launches sort of looking basically the same. And, you know, and then the satellite deploys or what have you. And, and uh, you know, it's funny how, how easily and... Um, we've just gotten used to these landings, that kind of mm -hmm. thing of like, so when you put yeah. it in perspective of like, oh wow, you know, 15 of them or whatever, it's like, it's really kind of crazy. But this particular launch and landing, uh, it felt like it just took forever to come back down. And then it was sort uh -huh. of like, landing, deploy, all right, good. And it was just like, everything happened all at once. It was like, boring, 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 boring. <laughs> ah. Like, it was yeah, like, literally like, <laughs> Literally, like, what was it, like 20, maybe 30 seconds after the landing, they had the payload deployment. Usually, it's it's quite a while afterwards. But yeah. again, this was just a, a low Earth orbit, you know, well, almost medium Earth orbit, sure. but still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that was, it was kind of cool, because then it was sort of like, and duh. <laughs> Uh, a speech yeah. vogel in the chat room saying, I like the word particular. I, there are a couple of words that I have a tendency to go towards, and particular is one of them, so I apologize. I will work on that. And particular. And particular. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Mr. Mike, we did have another launch. This is this one I, I also was kind of interested in. Uh, tell me more about Orbital ATK. Yeah, I was really excited for this launch. Um, what happened is this was a really unique, rare launch of a Minotaur 4 rocket, which is a four-stage solid rocket, although this one actually had five stages. We'll get to that in a little bit, but <laughs> let's check out the footage. This was from, well, first off, they renovated one of the pads at Cape Canaveral, Space Launch mm -hmm. Complex 46, which hasn't been used since 1999, the last had an Athena 2 rocket launching from it. So Orbital K ATK as well as Space Florida did a lot of work to renovate this pad for this and future missions. So let's check out the footage. Nice. Four, three, two, one. Ignition and liftoff of the Minotaur 4 rocket carrying the ORS-5 spacecraft for the United States Air Force. And there it goes into the clouds. <laughs> but Common problem. With the yeah. With this launch, though, uh, this launch uh, uh, happened just earlier this morning on uh, Saturday at uh, 6.04 Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, for my perspective, that was actually uh, late Friday night. But the payload for this mission was the ORS-5 satellite, or sensor sat, for the United States Air Force Operationally Responsive Space Office. And with this, it's going to be in a medium Earth orbit that's going to be looking out at objects in geosynchronous orbit. And unfortunately, there wasn't a whole lot of footage after they lost it on camera. That was after the second stage burnout. Uh, but they were able to successfully have uh, um, the, the payload deploy. And with the additional fifth stage, the fourth stage of this rocket is a small, what's called the Orion 38. It's a small solid rocket motor. And they stacked a second Orion 38 motor on top of that in order to have the, uh, the, <laughs> the payload get into a perfectly circular orbit at zero degrees inclination, which is equal with the equator. So I thought that that was really interesting that they did that for this, even though it's only supposed to be a four-stage rocket. It's like four-ish. 
Yo, we heard yeah. you need an extra stage, so we put a stage on your stage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, that is too funny. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's good. That's really good. All right, awesome. So, uh, Mr. Jared, we would be very remiss if we wouldn't talk more about all of the things that oh my gosh. you were been excited about forever, first of all. It feels like all month, we definitely, every single week, have talked about the eclipse. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now we've done it. It happened. And then... It was cool. That's oh, okay. all I have to say. Cool. Um, so, no. Mike, uh, no. <laughs> oh, it was awesome. <laughs> about. Oh, no. um, you know I'd be hurt if so... I, we didn't go into it. So, uh, yeah, tell me more about the eclipse, Jared. Yeah, so this was the first total solar eclipse visible in the United States since 1979. So it had been a bit of time since the last one. And also the first total solar eclipse visible only on land in the United States since... 1918. So this was an eclipse almost a century uh, of waiting for it to actually occur. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, some of the images that are, have come out of it are just have just been fantastic. This is from one of our viewers of the mm. show tomorrow, uh, David Pinsky. That's a great uh, now, shot. Now, a, a, a lot of study has gone into this and a lot of uh, suggestions, or a lot of people are basically saying that this was likely the most observed, the most image, and the most studied eclipse in human history. Um, the estimates are, are somewhere around 30 to 50 million people viewing the eclipse in the path of totality. Um, I mean, the entirety of the United States, plus uh, a little bit of Canada and a little bit of Mexico, uh, were able to see uh, a partial eclipse. But for the path of totality, 30 to 50 million people. I mean, just the lower number on that, 30 million people, mm -hmm. means that... In, um, in the United States with our population, one out of every 10 people went to the path of totality and saw it there. Um, wow. And uh, three NASA aircraft flew in the path of totality, um, thereby increasing the length of totality from two minutes, 42 seconds to about seven to eight minutes to do studies, both on the inner corona of the sun, which is that white, uh, that white thing that you see around, that sort of white wisp around the sun. That's the, that's the atmosphere of the sun called the corona. Um, and it's very difficult for us to study the inner corona Corona um, with our instruments, which we'll actually talk about a little bit in our next story, nice. uh, or at least my next story for me mm -hmm. um, on here. Um, and uh, we also studied Mercury as well while we were doing that. And uh, we got some great imagery from the GOES-16 uh, weather satellite. You'll see the, uh, the shadow of the eclipse approach on the west coast of the United States and then go across the continental United States here. Wow. So uh, really great imagery um, using the brand new GOES-16 weather satellite. Uh, for us to take a look at that and huh. uh, really cool to know that I'm in this picture um, somewhere there. So, yeah. uh, there were a ton of experiments that were done from the ground and one of the best things um, that actually happened was that there was there was very few places along the path of totality that actually had uh, bad weather. So it was pretty much almost clear on the entire path of totality except for uh, an area in Missouri. Uh, now, this is the view from the International Space Station. The, there were three passes of the space station and the astronauts took imagery uh, when they could actually see it. So this is what it looks like uh, if you're in space and looking back down uh, on the Earth. So I've seen plenty of photos uh, shared around that are faked or photoshopped, uh, but this is an actual image of what it looks like from the International Space Station. Nice. Now, uh, if you've got eclipse glasses, and you don't really want to keep them, don't throw them away because Astronomers Without Borders is actually accepting donations of your old old or unused eclipse glasses uh, so that they can then donate them to school children um, for upcoming eclipses in areas that may not be able uh, to get them particularly well. So if you want to find out how to donate your eclipse glasses, you can actually go to NASA's website about the eclipse and they have a page there that will tell you how to get to your eclipse glasses uh, to Astronomers Without Borders. I'm actually, I'm going to bring my to McGregor, Texas for 2024. Okay, sounds good. Is, is there going to be a flight test in the middle of the... Uh, of the I don't thing? know. Like we can get the Falcon 9 stage to go up and block the sun. I, I already told some of my friends, stuff. I'm like, hi, I'm staying with you. And they're like, I don't know if we'll be friends in that many years. I said, I don't really care. Yeah, I mean, who cares? So, <laughs> and speaking of friends, I really want to thank Micah and Beverly, who are two Tomorrow viewers that, uh, that basically saved this eclipse trip for me, um, invited me up there. And I also want to give a shout out to Kirk, uh, who's also a Tomorrow viewer, who I happen to run into on the back access roads that we were going up um, in Detroit Lake, Mi uh, Michigan, Oregon. Um, so yeah, I, I, that was really exciting uh, That what that was. And do we have time to actually show the footage I got of the eclipse? Oh, or sure, Or should we do it not? in After Dark? Uh, <laughs> do it. 
Yep. Do ben it. Okay, Ben said so do it. So here's here it go. is. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, I can see it getting darker. Yes. Oh, shadow bands, shadow bands. Shadow bands? It's working. Oh wow. Yeah. It's gone now. Oh wow. Oh, diamond ring. Oh, diamond ring. there it is. Oh. Oh, oh my god. That's the corona. That's exactly what the prediction was showing. Yeah. Glasses off, glasses off. Glasses off. No glasses, you guys. It's straight. Glasses off. No glasses. Look at the sun. That's awesome. Wow. wow, and it still just looks like the sun on my face. Wow. Back. So cool. That is, oh, man. <laughs> There's uh, Venus. <laughs> Right up there. Gotta do astronomy in the middle of the eclipse, right? I know, like, so, that's Jared. Yeah, it was it was a, a pretty amazing experience. Uh, I, I gotta say, I, I thought it was very cliched um, that people would say, I can't describe it to you, you just gotta go look at it. But really, that's kind of that's kind of how it is. And, and if we want to, I can talk more about it after dark today. But, oh, I'm uh, sure. Yeah, if, if I, you need to do everything you can. Drop what you're doing. Just make it happen. And go to the path of totality for a total solar eclipse. You will not regret it. You will remember it for the rest of your life, and it will absolutely change your perspective on things. So nice. It was, just, it was unbelievable. Uh, so. Somebody in the chat room yeah. mentioned, and I don't remember where it was, uh, but there's a total. There's a solar eclipse uh, like every couple of years. So if there's mm -hmm. one near you, definitely go there. Uh, for here in the U.S., next one is uh, 2024. Yes. Uh, it does happen to go. It starts uh, actually kind of hits Mexico and mm -hmm. then Texas and goes all the way up through the New England states. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe start making plans. 2,417 yeah. days away from today, by the way. Not so. a problem. But we'll I'm not going to count every one of them. Check so. that yeah. off the list. <laughs> All right. So, again, we'll do a little bit more of that in After Dark. But for right now, Mr. Mike, let's talk about some uh, astronaut taikonaut practice training. I don't even know what to call this, but this is really cool. <laughs> I love this. I love this first picture. Yeah, yeah. What this is, is this is a cooperation between um, uh, ESA astronauts. There was two of them that went and joined 16 Chinese astronauts, or taikonauts, excuse me, earlier this month for nine days of sea survival training. And the uh, uh, ESA astronauts who joined them, the European Space Agency astronauts, <coughs> excuse me, was Samantha Cristoforetti and Matthias Moore. And with this, uh, they had to do, the part of this started in 2015 when ESA signed a cooperation agreement with China to participate in human spaceflight with or without the United States and eventually go to the Chinese space station in 2022. Now, uh, in order to prepare for eventual flights together, they needed to practice with the, the Chinese pressure suits and also using the Chinese emergency equipment uh, in order so that they would be prepared for, for those sort of activities. Now, um, uh, for this next photo, it shows them practicing an emergency water landing uh, in the Shenzhou capsule. Normal missions with the Shenzhou will land on land just like the Soyuz capsule does, um, and water landings would only happen if there was a launch abort. Um, now, with this, I hope that when uh, this uh, cooperation becomes more visible, especially when ESA astronauts ride with Chinese astronauts into space, that uh, it might open up more things and uh, hopefully convince Congress to uh, start participating, or at least let NASA start participating. But uh, hmm. this also wasn't even the first time that taikonauts and astronauts have trained together under this agreement. Last year, uh, Yi... Uh, Guang Fu joined ESA's uh, caving course exercise in Sardinia that was doing extreme environment uh, survival training. And so they've been working on this for a couple of years. And now that things are kind of ramping up, I'm excited to see uh, what sort of operations they may, might have. In any case, I'm really glad to see this cooperation. And I hope that we, that NASA is able to cooperate together with uh, the Chinese taikonauts as well as the ESA astronauts in Russia, and that we can have a truly international space program. But in any case, this is really cool. There's some cool photos coming out of this. Yeah, totally. It's I just, oh, yeah. I 
any sort of astronaut, taikonaut, you know, any sort of other variation of that particular uh, verbiage, anyone who's been in space or is about to go into space really definitely still holds my fascination no matter how, how we're getting there. So I think it's, that's fairly, really yeah. cool. Um, all right. So, Mr. Jared, definitely. you uh, just going to keep going with a theme. Yes. Yep. There's and, a theme. And uh, going to continue to talk about eclipses. Yes, uh-huh. and specifically artificial eclipses, <laughs> which we really can't make here on the surface of the Earth, you know, because like we can't get like you know the moon. We don't have anything going that big. The sun the entire time. So artificial eclipse. Uh, artificial artificial eclipse, eclipse apparently. Ready? And go. Oh no! Oh no! Okay. Oh, oh no! 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 no, no. <laughs> that eclipse was not awe inspiring. It was just annoying. So. Yeah. Thanks for that, Ben. Uh, thanks, Ben. Fantastic. Um. Anyways. Uh, can we get- Never mind. No. Um, so, uh, the European Space Agency Thank you, Dada. has announced more details about their Proba 3 mission, which will be flying in the late 2020s. And they just so happen to do it the day after the eclipse. Uh, pretty good timing. Good timing. Um, now, this mission is going to study the sun's corona in great detail. And the way it's going to do that is two spacecraft will fly in formation with each other. One spacecraft, roughly the size of a refrigerator, will block the light from the sun, while the other spacecraft, about the size of a coffee table, will take imagery of the sun's corona. Now, the corona is very difficult to view as the light from the sun is about a million times brighter than the light coming from the corona. And we do use instruments called coronagraphs, and they block out the light from the sun, and we do carry them on several spacecraft that are in space right now observing the sun. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they often cover up the inner corona to do this, which means that we don't get the data about the inner corona. Uh, Now, because Proba 3 is in space, it won't have to contend with atmospheric distortion, which really sucks um, trying to see things, and the images will be precise, and we'll see the inner corona because the coronagraph, the space craft in this instance, will just barely cover up the sun. It won't wholly block the sun like coronagraphs that we currently have do. So basically we're using the spacecraft as a coronagraph. Awesome. They're going to fly in formation in orbit around the Earth and uh, we're going to get some really good data back. So basically we'll generate artificial eclipses um, to get longer looks at the corona and uh, maybe understand it in a little more detail. So very cool. Interesting. Uh, oh, Green Jim awesome. 2 in the chat room is asking, are refrigerators and coffee tables now standard measurement units? Um, yeah, I suppose if we're going to use American football fields, elephants, and uh, uh, what was the mini other stoges? one? Mini uh, stoges? Yes, mini stoges. Uh, refrigerators, coffee tables, um, and I suppose throw rugs are now units of measurement. So. All right. There Good go. to know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, I think uh, I think we've had enough for right at the moment, uh, which means we've got a couple of uh, other stories that we're going to do. We're going to get back to an after dark. So we're going to be talking about uh, some North Korea, Ukraine, Russian intrigue, which is I mean you say those three names together and I feel like there's always intrigue, and then uh, some mm-hmm. comets, which are not eclipses that Jared's going to be talking about for once. Man, oh man. But at least in this new section, you've got just eclipses. Yeah, that's all I talked about. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so good. All right, so we're going to take a break. And when we come back, Ben is going to have an interview with Bob Walker all talking a little bit about the National Space Council and a couple of other things. It's going to be a really good one. This one's really entertaining. So stay I'm with really us. Excited for this we'll interview. be right back. Look into her face that turn my name. And welcome to Tomorrow. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. Now, before we get started with this segment of the show, I did want to give a shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who would help to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Orbital subscribers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, today we're going to be talking about the National Space Council. And we are joined by Bob Walker, who has an incredibly impressive resume. Let me go over just a little bit of this. Uh, It actually goes on far more than just this. First off, he was the congressman for Pennsylvania from 1977 to 1997. That's 20 years. He was the chair of the House Science Committee during his last term. He was also the House Republican Chief Deputy Whip from 89 to 93. 
He was uh, appointed by President George W. Bush in 2001 to head up the Commission on the Future of the United States Aerospace Industry. And then in 2004, served on the Presidential Commission on the Implementation of the United States Space Exploration Policy. And in 2016, appointed a space policy advisor to Donald Trump's presidential campaign and is now on the board of directors for Zero G. So a huge background in aerospace and influ influence in aerospace from the uh, governmental uh, level. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us today. Sure, nice to be with you today. Uh, let's start off with um, the National Space Council. Uh, you know, I'm a hardcore space geek. I, you know, I obviously know NASA. I even knew NACA, uh, but I had not prior to uh, recently even heard of the National Space Council, even though it existed before. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, like, what is the council and why is it important? Well, the council really is designed to uh, coordinate space policy. As you know, there are three different sectors of space policy that we uh, deal with. Uh, we deal with the uh, civilian program, which is NASA. We deal with the military program, and we deal with the commercial program. All three of those uh, have been important factors in uh, space policy, uh, but uh, coordinating them and making certain that the assets that each bring to the table uh, are used in pursuit of national goals has always been uh, somewhat of, a, of, of an issue. And so um, the idea behind the space policy or the National Space Council is to assure that space policy reflects uh, the contributions that all of those sectors can make uh, to having a dynamic and uh, global leading uh, space program. And um, we think uh, that uh, the uh, Space Council that uh, existed under the uh, first uh, George H.W. Bush um, was um, uh, a valuable part of the uh, overall space uh, community. Uh, it did not perform as effectively as some would like uh, and uh, Vice President Gore wanted to take over the whole science and space uh, regime when he uh, came in as vice president, and he ended the Space Council. Uh, there have been a number of us who have believed for a long time uh, that it should be uh, revived. Uh, when I helped uh, develop the uh, space policy for the Trump campaign, one of the elements that we put in was the uh, Space Council. Uh, and um, uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, propitious that... Uh, uh, Vice President uh, Pence, uh, even at that time, indicated that uh, one of his uh, most rewarding assignments would be to be chairman of the National Space Council. And so um, we are in the process of getting it all stood up at the present time. An executive secretary has been appointed. He's beginning to staff up the, uh, the Space Council. And we would hope within a few weeks now we will begin to see uh, some of that coordination um, uh, take place as we bring more and more people on board, and for instance, the NASA administrator has yet to be named, but as we bring uh, him on board or her on board, uh, whichever it turns out to be, uh, we would hope uh, that um, uh, we would begin to see some vibrancy uh, out of all sectors of the space community, uh, but in particular, um, uh, have it coordinated by the Space Council. Uh, now, you mentioned NASA a little bit, and I, I think one of the issues with NASA is that every time we get a new president, uh, the focus of NASA can shift wildly from one area to another. Will the Space Council help to prevent some of that wild shift in policy, or is it just kind of more of, of an oversight? Of course, the Space Council serves at the uh, uh, behest of the president, too, uh, and so there's no uh, assurance that if he shifts policy uh, that uh, that won't be reflected in uh, uh, Space Council as well. Uh, what the Space Council will do, though, is take whatever policy the president wants to pursue and assure that everybody's singing off the same page. For instance, uh, you know, if heavy lift capacity is needed uh, to uh, get us to uh, low Earth orbit, well, uh, you know, we know that in the commercial community right now, there are a number of heavy lift systems being developed. We know that NASA is developing a heavy lift system. Uh, we, we can begin to coordinate and figure out which of those assets works the best uh, for whatever program uh, we're pursuing, either on the military front or on the civilian front. And to that point, uh, what are some of the things that the Nas uh, National Space Council would be able to do that otherwise wouldn't be able to get done or be very difficult to do? Well, what's really difficult is to coordinate agencies. I mean, there are uh, many different agencies of the federal government that have space responsibilities. Uh, and so uh, having all of them coordinated and, and uh, as much as possible singing off the same song sheet 
uh, is, is a really difficult task. The National Space Council can also uh, uh, reach out and pull in uh, intellectual material uh, from people uh, all across the country and all across the world. It can also facilitate a lot of our international connections. Uh, many of our programs uh, uh, looking forward, particularly in the exploration area, may involve a lot of cooperation with international um, uh, partners. And so uh, what we ha will have in the National Space Council is a place that looks at uh, what those partners may be able to contribute and how that will uh, further the aims that our national goals uh, are, are moving toward. You know, you talk a lot about uh, like deduplication of work. Um, and if we just kind of look at the industry as a whole right now uh, and kind of what NASA is working on and kind of what some of the commercial sector is look working on, uh, you know, you've got some great companies in the commercial sector, Blue Origin, uh, you've got SpaceX, you've got um, even United Launch Alliance working on super heavy lift launchers. But you also have NASA working on its own super heavy lift launcher. Uh, would, would the Space Council look, look at all of that and go, okay, well, maybe the space launch system doesn't make sense? Could, could it put the space launch system at risk? Or does it not look at it that way? Well, I think the administration has made fairly clear that um, uh, they are not going to um, uh, go after the uh, space launch system uh, and um, uh, that they are going to continue uh, to um, uh, move it forward. Now, if, if the cost uh, soars out of sight, if the schedule uh, doesn't get met, uh, if we find in the future that the heavy lift systems that are available in the commercial community uh, will serve our needs uh, better than the, the SLS. There are a whole bunch of questions uh, moving forward uh, that may have to be answered, but for the present time, I think uh, the case has been made uh, largely by the Congress uh, that they want the SLS system as a part of our uh, national uh, program and uh, that uh, uh, this administration is not likely uh, in its earliest days anyway to, uh, to, to raise any questions about that. Uh, so you, you're a pretty big proponent for the, the National Space Council. Uh, what is the number one thing that you think will make a difference with the Council? Uh, it sounds like it's deduplication of work, but is there, is there anything else uh, above and beyond that that the Council will help to bring to the table? Well, I think it's, you know, the, the coordination means that you can set real national goals and, and have a method to, uh, uh, to deal with them. Uh, you don't have the military going off one direction uh, in terms of developing uh, uh, technologies and uh, that are different from uh, a direction that NASA might be going, uh, or um, uh, finding out that um, uh, indeed there are even better options available in the commercial community. And so having someone pull all of that information together uh, in a way that uh, helps uh, move us forward uh, uh, as aggressively as possible, I think is a real major role. And the other major role is the one I mentioned a few, a few minutes ago, and that is um, it, it's hard for some of our uh, uh, space uh, operators uh, to do the international role. And the reason for that is uh, if it's our military that's doing it, uh, that's seen as a military en enterprise. And there are some nations that back away from that. Uh, there are places where uh, NASA uh, has built uh, very strong international relationships, uh, but in, in some cases they're seen as a competitor. Uh, to uh, nations uh, around the world. And so having a space council that's acting on behalf of the White House uh, gives you an international cachet uh, that is a little bit uh, different from anything that is available uh, amongst our uh, many agencies that uh, do space-related activities. A couple questions from the chat room. The first one come up, comes up from Smokey asking, does the National Space Council have an education outreach plan? Is there consideration for inspiring and educating the next generation of engineers, scientists, and astronauts? Well, I think that'll be largely up to the, to the agencies involved. Remember, I mean, what the Space Council is made up of is, um, uh, I think it's uh, 13 different agencies, uh, and it's largely the heads of those agencies that make up the Space Council. The Space Council itself is not going to be doing educational programs, but as, as you know, uh, NASA does educational programs. There are military programs that uh, are, are educational in, in nature. The Space Council will be a fairly small stack. I mean, we're not talking about having a huge new agency here. We're talking about a fairly small small step. Think of, think of the National Security Council and the way it, in which it coordinates out of the White House the things that go on 
uh, in our uh, foreign policy and defense policy uh, arenas and in our, in our intelligence policy. Well, the, 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 the Space Council acts in that kind of role and is not going to be designing and bringing forth programs of its own. Uh, so you answered this next question a, a, a little bit, and I, I'll follow on with it uh, a bit. This one comes from Green, Green Jim asking, uh, once you set real national goals, what's to stop the next administration from changing the National Space Council and the national goals? That's the problem NASA has at the moment. Uh, and expanding on that a little bit, um, would it make any sense, you had mentioned earlier uh, the council works at the behest of the president, would it make any sense to not have the council work that way and work on longer range missions and, uh, and larger scope objects? Well, we'll be working on longer range missions and, and, and looking forward and hopefully a new administration coming in would take a look at, at uh, what had been developed and uh, see some advantages in that. Uh, but uh, in all honesty, what elections are about in this country is bringing in leadership that uh, gets its chance uh, to, ref to do national policy. And uh, uh, space policy is going to be more and more of a factor in all of that. I mean, we're, we're beginning to recognize uh, the uh, vulnerabilities that we have uh, with many of our space assets that serve not only military needs but massive economic needs at the present time uh, and um, new administrations may want to uh, uh, to adjust policy uh, to fit the needs of the moment because uh, those needs uh, are changing very rapidly uh, we now know that having a space de uh, defense system uh, to uh, do something about uh, protecting ourselves from uh, the madmen in north korea uh, is uh, something that we probably uh, need to have as a, as a priority at the present time. That was not seen as a priority uh, so much uh, even a year ago. So that, that definitely makes sense. Uh, I, I think if we were to split the classification, the, the military side, uh, obviously you need to be kind of in the, in the moment, right? I mean, you have to know what those threats are and you can't have, you know, uh, you need to be able to adjust to those in real time. The NASA side of it, the exploration side of it, it's a little more complicated, right? G putting humans on Mars, that is not something that will happen in two presidential uh, terms, right? That, that's a long-term project. And, and we, we see a lot of problems with, you know, we had Constellation, which was canceled. Now we have a space launch system, which many think uh, that it may fly once, maybe. It's super expensive. Um, it's kind of a derivative of this other thing. Uh, there, there seems to be a, a, this flounder, floundering and lack of vision at NASA, and I, I realize we're kind of trying to use the Space Council as a way to stop that from happening. Is that, is that just not the role of a council? Uh, it just, it, it's not what it would serve, and is, is there a better way to fix that problem with NASA? Well, but remember, uh, part of the issue here is also the United States Congress. It's not just the administrations who come in. Uh, much of the uh, impetus behind the uh, Space launch system after Constellation was uh, uh, was ended uh, was Congress deciding that they wanted to have a, a NASA program uh, building a, uh, a big new rocket, uh, and they've been the protectors of it. And so and so, dis despite what the administration may want to do, uh, the fact is that Congress decides uh, what's going to get funded and what's not going to get funded. And so we're we're, we're going to see uh, that play itself out too. But. The, the, the point here is that that um, the council can can look forward and 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 can begin uh, to um, uh, take the assets of the commercial community. For instance, the, the, one of the most aggressive people in terms of uh, saying we need to go to Mars is is not inside the government. It's Elon Musk on the outside of the government, uh, and um, uh, you know uh, Jeff Bezos. Uh, you know, wants to go to the moon and is developing landing vehicles to go to the moon. So despite what government may decide to do or not decide to do, um, the, the, the fact is that we have commercial interests now who uh, are well-funded uh, and have uh, some ability to, to move forward. And the question is, how do you get government to be more cooperative uh, and, and, and more inclusive of some of those people who are bringing great new innovations uh, into the space uh, world. Um, uh, the idea that you can actually uh, reuse uh, some of the rocket systems uh, that both uh, uh, Musk and Bezos have now uh, brought us to means that we can now think about going to space in much more inexpensive ways. It may well be that we don't want to build huge chemical rockets that actually get us all the way out to Mars uh, in the future, it may well be that we want to lose the we want to use the expertise 
uh, that we have developed in, in building the space station to build very complex rocket systems in space and lift them to low Earth orbit and assemble them there and send them out. And NASA has moved us a bit in that direction recently uh, by uh, saying that they're going to go back to beginning to develop nuclear engines uh, for space exploration. I'm a huge advocate for that because at that point, you can power your way all the way out to Mars and all the way back. You can power your way out to uh, Europa to do the uh, mission uh, that Chairman Culbertson uh, would like to do. Uh, and it means that you can do it in a time frame that doesn't take uh, months and months and months to do it. Uh, you cut the trip to Mars from months to weeks uh, if you can power your way through a vacuum uh, all the way out there. So, uh, so these are developments now where the commercial community is giving us opportunities that we didn't see that we had before. Uh, and uh, those opportunities, I think, will uh, lead to a very exciting future. So speaking of commercial space, um, uh, this question comes from Randy, uh, which is, would the Space Council help urge military to contract with newer space providers, such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, even maybe Mass and Space Systems, so forth and so on? Well, well that's already beginning to happen. I mean, I, one of the more exciting things that's happened here in the last uh, uh, few months uh, is the fact that, uh, uh, that SpaceX uh, has gotten contracts to uh, fly uh, military missions. And uh, of course, they've been flying NASA missions uh, for some time. And now you're going to add uh, Sierra Nevada to, with its uh, uh, lift uh, to uh, to take cargo uh, out to the, uh, the space station. I mean, there are a lot of those things happening. And so the answer is yes. Part of the Space Council's role here is going to be to see how we can make the most efficient use of all the assets we have. And so uh, if uh, one of the great assets we have are these commercial vehicles, uh, the military ought to be using a lot more of, of that capability. And kind of to those ends as well, uh, Strati asks, how much interaction with Congress will the council have? Because it, uh, I mean, it's, it's everyone kind of has to agree on everything. Well, uh, I, think, uh, I think what it will do is it will give the Congress another uh, voice, and in this case, a, a, a voice coming directly out of the White House of what uh, they think is important. And so um, uh, what we've now added is not just the NASA administrator up advocating for programs or, or the secretary of the Air Force. Uh, you now have the White House on board and in the personage of the vice president of the United States, who is chairman of the council, uh, that brings a lot more heft uh, to uh, moving the president's program forward uh, than uh, you have otherwise. Is that what happened under the Obama administration, right? I mean, we, we ended the space shuttle, that, that was already set in stone, uh, and then we ended Constellation, and the Obama administration really wanted to focus on commercial space. And as you said, Congress said, no, 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 we want to have our rocket. In your opinion, if they, if they had the National Space Council under the Obama administration, would that have helped uh, push the president's agenda through a little bit better? Well, as I say, the, 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 one of the issues here uh, with uh, the um, uh, SLS system uh, is the fact that uh, there are a number of centers uh, that are involved in that project, uh, a number of NASA centers. Uh, those centers all have their political supporters on Capitol Hill. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, when Constellation was lost, all of those people got together and said, uh, uh, we don't care what the administration thinks. Uh, we're going to have a program that uh, builds, you know, uh, the biggest, baddest rocket uh, that uh, we can muster. Uh, and so um, uh, the, the Space Council may have uh, been able to, uh, to demonstrate uh, better than uh, NASA was able to demonstrate uh, that there would be commercial assets coming on board uh, that could fulfill this role. In, in a way, the, the, the commission that recommended the uh, Constellation be canceled tried to do that, uh, but then it was, it was a commission report. It wasn't really the White House um, making that case strongly. Uh, and uh, so um, um, I, I don't know that the council is, is a full um, uh, answer uh, to that uh, dilemma, but it, it brings a, a new voice and, and a very powerful voice uh, into the debate. It, it certainly wouldn't have hurt, uh, but it may not have helped uh, because as you mentioned, there's a, there are a lot more forces going on there. Uh, it would have been cool, uh, you know, just as a personal note, it would have been cool for NASA to focus on, as you mentioned earlier, nuclear propulsion, uh, because, you know, that's really, really difficult for the private sector to focus on. Uh, it's just... Well, 
Well, no, no, no doubt about that. And uh, look, we were looking into nuclear engines back uh, back many years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the first work on that started back in the late '60s, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, then NASA uh, they didn't really cancel the program, but they 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 just kind of had a few people. Uh, looking at it over a period of time. Now it looks like they're going to get, get back and be aggressive about it. The, the, the difference right now is the fact uh, that you do have the capability of lifting those uh, nuclear proponents into orbit uh, with inert um, uh, nuclear um, fuel in them uh, so that they don't propose a danger. Uh, and um, uh, and we're, we're much further down the road toward being able to do that very, very safely uh, than we were 40 years ago. Uh, and so now as we're thinking about going into deep space, uh, it becomes far more of, a, um, of an imperative uh, to think about what the engine should be that take us uh, out to the end of the, of the solar system. Uh, the, 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 the Trump the Trump campaign document on space said that the, that the goal of this country should be ex expo human exploration of the entire solar system by the end of the century. Now, that's a big stretch goal, uh, but you can't do it <laughs> using chemical rockets. There's no doubt about that. I, I realize we've gotten off course, but uh, uh, I'm, it's super exciting, right? I, I mean, this this is stuff that could forever change humanity. So. Uh, I really hope, I, I, I know this is not really linked to the National Space Council that much, but I really do hope that happens. Uh, that would be absolutely incredible. It's going to be a bit of a hard sales pitch to the American people, uh, but if, if they can understand that it is in fact safe and it is going to be good for them, uh, then I, hopefully it will happen someday in the not too distant future. All right, uh, well, go the, ahead. There are, there are a number of steps before we get there. I mean, mm -hmm. going back to the moon is an, a very important part of, uh, of making all all of these things happen, uh, because um, you know you need you need the experience of humans living in a hostile uh, atmosphere like the moon uh, to tell you what's um, uh, ahead, uh, moving on out into the solar system. Uh, you also uh, can use the moon uh, as a supply base uh, for uh, those missions uh, using uh, cislunar. Uh, capabilities and so so there are a number of steps to be taken along the way but there's no doubt that the, the development of, of engines that allow powering uh, throughout uh, your entire mission uh, in the uh, solar system uh, would be a giant step forward uh, it, it totally agree I, th I think it's going to be uh, exciting and hopefully we start to see uh, some of that happen in the moderately near-term future uh, even just creating a lunar colony would be, uh, A, super inspiring. Uh, just being able to look up at the moon and go, there are people there living there right now. That would be absolutely incredible. And hopefully it will kind of jumpstart. Absolutely right. And um, uh, the, the fact is that you, uh, I, give, I give NASA a lot of credit for, for years and years and years. Some of us have been saying to NASA, you've got to uh, get uh, moving on doing something with nuclear en engines. And... Uh, uh, there, there has been a lot of pushback uh, from the old institutional uh, providers who weren't particularly interested in doing that. They were in, interested in, in building uh, the rocket engines that they're, that they're now building. Well, now you have uh, so, some new uh, people in town uh, who are saying, no, we can, look, we can look beyond that and give NASA the uh, credit. Uh, under uh, Bob Lightfoot as the acting administrator, they put forward uh, a plan uh, to begin to ramp up uh, the uh, uh, the work on developing those uh, nuclear engines. That That's going to be very cool, very exciting. All right, I'd like to wrap up the interview with uh, five general questions that we ask all of our guests. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers, and I have a feeling I know the answer to the first question, uh, which is uh, moon or Mars first? Moon first. <laughs> yep, that's where I figured, figured you'd say. Uh, would you go? Sure, absolutely. When do you think humans will first land on Mars? I think we'll probably be there in the 2030s. When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Uh, hopefully by the end of um, Donald Trump's uh, term. So uh, within the next, before the next decade, within the next 10 years? Within and, the next 10 years. Yep. Uh, I, I, I hope that we can uh, get an aggressive program together uh, that will put uh, uh, humans back on the moon 
uh, in the vicinity of 20, uh, 23, 2024. Uh, do you think, uh, how realistic is and that? I, I, I think we'll have a super, circumlunar flight uh, even before that. I mean, I, you know, uh, and I, look, I think the commercial community is going to do a circumlunar fly, flight uh, probably within the next uh, couple of years. Oh, I mean, Elon Musk said that's exactly what they're planning on doing, right? They're going to go sure, out. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think the capabilities are there now to do that. Uh, and last question, why space? Uh, because it, it represents uh, all of our uh, hopes and dreams for the future. I mean, what we learn by uh, going uh, out beyond uh, our known capabilities uh, is that we develop new capabilities. And we've learned that in the space program uh, uh, already uh, over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. And we will learn so, so much more. Uh, it's the destiny of humans uh, to extend themselves uh, into the universe. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the excitement uh, that you uh, get about doing that uh, will uh, propel not only this nation, but uh, the whole global community forward uh, in ways that we can't even really imagine. Bob, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, it was uh, actually a lot of fun. Uh, the nuclear energy side of it, uh, or propulsion, excuse me, uh, is something that I think is very exciting, uh, as is the Space Council, the National Space Council. I think this is all really good stuff for the American people and actually the world as a whole. I think it's going to be uh, really incredible to watch this unfold over the next uh, 48, four to eight years. So thank you so much for taking time. Sure, nice to be with you. All right, we're going to uh, take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and space. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. You know, that is one of the few times in tomorrow that I was actually nervous doing the interview. Yeah? Uh, yeah, because it's, it's uh, you know, uh, Bob Walker has a large amount of influence on policy and space. And um, it's cool that he's very passionate, uh, but yeah. That was uh, that was a little nerve wracking for me. I, I hope also, it didn't show. <laughs> hope it didn't show. But I was like, oh, I hope I don't sound like an I, idiot. Well, I also like that uh, it's still clear to him that we're a bit of a startup because he was like, "Good luck to you," and I was like, <laughs> thanks, "Thanks, thank thanks. you." <laughs> I mean, thanks. don't get me wrong, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but if that, that was funny. Yeah, right, no, well, really, really good interview. I before we get into comments from uh, last week's show, a shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen, uh, which was mocked earlier in the show. Uh, these are people who've contributed. Oh wait, wait, hang on, I've well, got what it. What did I say? No, no, no. Did you bring it up on screen? The comment from Destructor Seventeen Oh One. Oh, it's not, I'm not going. Anyhow, these are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Orbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And we've got our Suborbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $2.50 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you 
and help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TM. R O R I. Oh, I see what you're saying. It was the particular thing. Actually, yeah. that's those are yeah. your words. I only that's because you started saying that, I, and then I just <laughs> I, like, I don't even I gotta, know what I'm I'll saying anymore. It it's okay, terrible. So that worked. Let me see if I can get this working again. So like that, uh, I mm-hmm. cannot get it to. Nope, it's not going to go. That's all right. Okay, first up, Capcom. All right. So, uh, in case you missed it, like I did, uh, the last <laughs> <laughs> the last show. Well, I wasn't here. Uh, was Dwight Stephen Bunyaki talking about uh, searching for Skylab? So that's what uh, most the of these are talking about. Forthcoming documentary. Yes. Searching for Skylab. So excited! All right. So first one comes off of YouTube. This one's from Ilyrian. Yeah, sure. Ilyrian. 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 Perfect. Uh, at Dwight, <laughs> sorry to be nitpicky, <laughs> but no, it does not create jobs. The resources for a space program are coming from somewhere else, and the same number of people or more are employed there. It's just moving water from one end of the pool to the other and some loss of water on the way. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't agree with that. Yeah, jobs are not, it's not like you're just taking jobs from one area to another. Uh, there's no guarantee of jobs, right? Mm-hmm. So, right. um now, I'm not advocating using uh, space as a jobs program. I think we should use space to further humanity, uh, which, if you have that goal in mind, it will create jobs, mm-hmm. right? So if you do it for the right reasons, you actually create a lot more jobs than if you create a jobs program, if that makes any sense, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, however, um, not, just not having the programs doesn't mean that these engineers are going to be hired somewhere else. Um, if you don't have the programs, then you know, there are fewer jobs available now. It, it's, it's, there's, the pool's not as big anymore, and now you have too much water to fit into the pool, using your same analogy, and it's gonna spill out somewhere else, it's just gonna get, it's just not gonna have anywhere to go, if that makes any, was that, did that analogy work? Ish? I kinda feel like the jobs, and I think that, oh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, we might be about to say the same here thing here, but uh, I feel like you almost have to have at least at least when it's concerning some sort of government project, you have to have at least some sort of promise of jobs in order to get support and have the program actually happen in the first place. But uh, yeah, what were you going to say, Jared? Uh, I was going to say that a lot of the jobs involved in spaceflight end up uh, needing a certain level of specialization that is that is not found in other industries. Mm. Um, so it, it's it's not necessarily about it does not create jobs. Um, it's just it creates it can, especially in engineering. There's there's a multitude of areas that you can go into, but you end up having to have some sort of specialization um, that works with that. So it, it does end up creating jobs when you when you do that, especially like for environmental uh, control and things like that. It's it's just very specialized, and uh, there's often not a lot of uh, uh, area for those types of engineering. Out, broadly outside of space flight. So, um, like, you can obviously use it in certain areas, but um, it's a very narrow sort of focus that you end up doing when you specifically want to do things like, like astrodynamics or uh, developing spacecraft and things like that. Although I will say that the engineers who work in aerospace can generally also do other engineering. Yeah. It's just not necessarily flipped around the other direction. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Next up, Capcom. All right. Uh, also comes off of YouTube. This is from Doug Gwynn. Oh, I'm Doug? What, what are you doing Doug? to us, Doug? Come on, Doug. I already I read ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Stay with the class. Uh, <laughs> if you guys want to spend some time playing Kerbal Space Program, you could answer questions about orbital orbital mechanics more accurately. What, what were we <clears> inaccurate? <throat> yeah. To be fair, I can't even read some of this stuff accurately. Well, so hang on, hang on. What, what were we, Mike? Do you remember what were we inaccurate on orbital mechanics? Uh, I'm not sure about what we were talking about this last episode, but I think that this might just be in reference normally. I mean, I understand what apogee and perigee, but it's sometimes hard to explain that and, and be able to visualize that without, you know, appropriate graphics. So I feel like that's my kind of hang-up, and I don't want to use too uh, technical of terms. But I mean, I'm I still consider myself, a, you know, very much an amateur. So what I do know is from, you know, I learned from Kerbal Space Program. So I don't think that's a fair comment. I, I think this is in relation to my comment about uh, falling constantly being in orbit. That's what an orbit is, though. Right. Yeah. I, so. I, I, I disagree with his assessment. Yeah, I disagree too. I think if you really want to learn orbital mechanics, you should pick up the 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 spaceflight simulator called Orbiter. Yeah, so there's that. The, the that will teach you here's, real here's what you know. Here's where this comes mechanics. from. There was so. a cute NKC or XKCD 
a comic talking about, you know, <laughs> my, right? Everyone knows what, I, the space geeks know. Oh, so like, this is a joke comment, though. It, well, I, you know, I'm not sure. I think a lot of people took the XKCD comment to heart. Like, you know, how much you knew about orbital mechanics, got hired at NASA, and then, you know, started playing Kerbal Space Program and goes up and to the right. Uh, and, and I don't, <laughs> it's funny, right? It's funny. Yeah. But that's just it, it's funny. I'm not sure that that's true. Um, it may be true in certain cases. Uh, I'm not saying Kerbal's bad. Kerbal's great, and you totally should. I just don't think that comment is fair. From, right, yeah, from, from KSP, you can gain a, a very general and broad understanding of orbital mechanics, but to actually understand it, there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Kerbal breaks a lot of physics. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of, let's yeah. go to, let's yeah, go to our next exactly. one. Uh-oh. Great. <laughs> this one comes off of YouTube. This is from Scott Provost. Provost. Uh, weightlessness is not a function altitude. If you could drive fast on Earth or even under the Earth, such as under loop, is that like hyperloop but different? <laughs> uh, you would experience weightlessness. All spheres of atmosphere are defined. Space is not a scientific term. Scientists speak in scientific terms. And we'll let you kind of read the, the difference. So this also goes to the, the Carmen line argument that we've had, which will likely be a show in the future. Um, I, I'm not sure that uh, this is entirely correct, though. Uh, so saying that weightlessness is not a function of altitude is not necessarily incorrect either, uh, but it is going to be a function of uh, certainly gravity's impact on inertia. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and inertia is a very valid point, which is if you could drive fast enough on Earth or even under the Earth, you're going to have inertia pressing back against you as you go faster and faster. So you will always experience some form of gravity or accelerated gravity, not reduced gravity. Where you, where you feel uh, simulate like weightless is when you have a parabolic flight where you're, you're actually falling at the same speed that gravity is pulling you down. Yeah, and it's, it's not a loss of gravity, it's just that you're, you're falling at, at the, the same, same rate that gravity is pulling you down. So you're experiencing so. weightlessness at that point, you're, you're not, you're not we would, well. I would prefer to call that microgravity as opposed to weightlessness. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it, that's yeah, about, yeah, 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 we gotta choose our words station. carefully here, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you do still have gravity pressing on you, so you do still have gravity still pulling on you. It's just that that yeah, when you're that, in that's orbit, even more correct. your forward yeah, exactly. momentum is is balancing out with the pull of gravity. But if you get far enough away from the Earth, the influence of Earth's gravity, uh, a couple things. First, you're probably not far enough away from the Sun to yep. get away from its influence. So that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So and that's why you're you're not really ever in zero gravity. You're in microgravity when you're out in space. So. Uh, you know, the, the comment is, is, if we're talking about the Kármán line, I kind of tend to agree, you know, like, defining where the well, border I mean, of space is, okay, why is it 100 kilometers? Who's, that's a whole different conversation. But then saying weightlessness is not a function of altitude, well, I mean, that's true, but it's also not true. It is a, it's going to be, uh, microgravity is going to be a function of your, pro, your proximity to a gravitational object. How's that? Mm, I, I guess that, that he's, he's <laughs> technically right that space is not a scientific term. I mean, technically everything that's in space right now is either in the thermosphere or the exosphere. So, I mean, he's technically right about that. But, um, yeah, this is, this is a conversation for another time so that we can all be in agreement. I would say that space is a scientific term. It's just that it's a very broad scientific term. And sometimes in science the, it's okay to have broad terms. The funny thing is I'm trying to read Vax Headroom. He's like, it's, he, he goes from it's 100% true but I don't know what he's referencing to no, it isn't, which I also don't know what he is referencing <laughs> <laughs> because of the delay. So, all right, that's fine. So, yeah. Yeah, and to be fair, we are in space right now. We're on Spaceship Earth. So, yeah. there you go. All right, we're next. experiencing space time. <laughs> oh my gosh, now it's... Uh, going so, Smokey Dirt really quickly says, I like to cook while I'm watching tomorrow because it makes me feel like I'm craft services for them, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> 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 so, thank you. Thank you for that. I very much so appreciate that one. Vogan, if you don't know what space is, how can you do your, how can you do your show? Oh, no. Well, that's it. I guess we're out of here. We're out. So, we're all right. Out. See you guys. Actually, I'll be back is... in a couple wait, weeks. Wait, wait, wait. To be fair, are we, are we not all then learning together? Oh, oh something. Oh, there's something. something. The wow. Wholesome, the wholesome wow. way. <laughs> all right, fine. Uh, all right, you all right. Suck. Uh, okay. Next up, next, next up. Next one comes off of YouTube. Uh, funny <laughs> enough, talking about YouTube, it says, uh, this is from Earfront. It says, uh, Miss Amy Shearer title on her YouTube page, Vintage Space, explained just what that sound is slash was, and here's the YouTube link for that. 
So. What he's referencing is uh, when we had an <laughs> Atlas V launch uh, last week, there was a really loud uh, whoop sound right before whoop? takeoff. Right. And uh, um, yes, uh, uh, Amy does have a really good video explaining what that sound was for the Titan rockets. Right. And when you watch that, you might understand what I mean here about how the Titan rockets use a completely different type of fuel than the Atlas V rockets. So yes. it's not the same causation. And we don't hear that whooping noise uh, the rest of the time. In fact, I think that that noise that we heard on that Atlas V launch might have just been the external noise over the speakers of them doing the finished countdown. So yeah. I don't think that that was actually the engine at all. But I don't know. We should ask Tori. Uh, actually, I did want to bring it up for that exact reason, which is it is uh, she's referring to uh, the hypergalls on the... Um, uh, it was Titan. Titan two. Titan, Titan yeah. two. On yeah. Titan and yeah, the, uh, the launch vehicle. Very yeah, nice. the Atlas does not use hypergalls on on its first stage. It's it's uh, hi, it's a Hydrolox engine, right? Uh, uh, no, Atlas no, five is uh, Carolox. Carolox. Oh, that's right. Of course it is because the, it's the, uh, R, it's the RD eighty. Yeah, so it's a Carolox on the first stage. So um, if if you were if it were. you don't hear that same noise on a Falcon, which is mm -hmm. also a Carolox engine. Mm -hmm. So there's something. There's something specific going on there. Maybe it is that, but I feel like I've heard it a couple times on an Atlas. I feel like the Falcons have gotten quieter recently. Like even like all the past launches, there's just this hissing noise instead of the normal boom, you know, the roar that we've gotten on the first like 20 launches or so. So I don't know. Hmm. Maybe we can talk about that later. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, also, um, you guys don't have it in the rundown, uh, but on that last comment slate. Um, I created a Bitly URL, <laughs> which is why I was why I was giggling, and it's uh, bit.ly slash rocket farts. <laughs> Just why I was wow! Laughing. Yep. What well done. <laughs> In here, I thought I was the child on the show. And yeah, no, I'm the child on the show. <laughs> I'm the child on the show. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, yeah. Last comment. Uh, well, and even uh, Vax Hedrum in the chat room says that you can hear a similar uh, thing in his last video of the Antares launch. Um, so, okay, anyway, so last comment also, again, comes off of YouTube because that's just where you guys like to comment, which is fine. doesn't really matter to me. Uh, I will note really quickly, though, that if you decide to comment on someplace other than YouTube, uh, the chances of your comment being featured are probably... They're higher. They are higher because yes, we, we like to spatter in the other ones. We like to you know bring in Reddit and bring in Twitter and bring in Facebook. Uh, and Patreon but, and uh, Tomorrow.tv. Oh, yeah. All like, of them. There's a lot of places you can comment. We've even had people email them directly to us. Don't uh, do that, though, because then your comment's not shared and it will almost certainly not make it on the show. If you email me your comment, it's not making it on the show, just so you know. Just saying. Okay. Yes. Anyhow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this one happens to come off of YouTube. Uh, this one's from Jamie Good Godman. Uh, says Electron was not spinning fast enough to stabilize the rocket, and the spin stopped once the vacuum engine kicked in. I think the spin was not necessary. Very cool that the plume and the engines look just like Falcon 9, since Electron uses the same Octaweb configuration. Yeah. Which, so, uh, by, yeah uh, so I don't think we I don't think we said that the spin was for stabilization. I, at least I said I thought it was a barbecue roll. <sighs> That, I think that was me, yeah. We were talking about that, and we were talking about that that could be what it was. But, I mean, we haven't really gotten word of whether or not that was a mistake or it, not. Which, it could have been a mistake as well. Like, if you looked at the very first Falcon 9 launch, uh, it didn't roll, but you watch it go off the pad, it kind of went whoop off the hook. Another whoop noise. Did it make that noise? <laughs> Apparently, we're making no, whoop just, noises with uh, Carolox rocks. Yeah, it just kind of, you know, rotated off the pad. Um, I, I don't know if maybe there was a roll control issue with the first stage of Electron, or if it was. So barbecue rolls, where you're very, where you're basically rolling the rocket around yeah. to cook it uh, evenly. The Apollo spacecraft did that on the way to the moon. They, they did a roll for thermal very, control. Basically. Yeah, you do, the thing is, I don't know why you would need to barbecue roll that early into flight uh, through atmosphere. Has there actually been any like official word from? A rocket lab that no. says what the role was for, no, or was it just saying, basically yeah. no? That's like, more all speculation. We lost roll control, and we're just gonna go with that because it looks like well, it's they, stabilized. They may not have lost roll control. They just may not have had full roll control. Like they may have, they, like maybe they didn't have enough control over mm -hmm. the roll. Like they didn't have enough ability to counteract it. Yeah. Um, or maybe it was intentional. Or who knows? I mean, it could be yeah. a bunch of different things. All we're doing is looking at the footage going, that's weird. Yeah, it might right. have to do with yaw steering, which is a very important thing that some rockets actually don't have. Hmm. 
So, which is mm. why, why um, I believe Falcon 9 doesn't have yaw steering, which is why certain launch windows are instantaneous as opposed to um, certain other rockets to uh, the similar orbits having, having launch windows a couple minutes long. So I, it may have something to do with that. Maybe they don't, didn't have like yaw steering or something implemented mm. in the rocket yet. So uh, Vax Hedrum said there would be no reason for a barbecue roll on launch. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, th it looked like a barbecue roll. There's no mention roll. of it in the report either. Yeah, right. It looked like a barbecue roll. It wouldn't be for stabilization. It was way too slow. Um, but it, again, like I said earlier, I, I don't know why you would barbecue roll that early into flight through atmosphere. You it just saw doesn't no make roll. sense. It, yeah, there was no roll here. It just doesn't make sense. And maybe if it they doesn't... were in space for a while and they had the sun barreling down on them, maybe. But and maybe it doesn't matter. That's true. Yeah, I mean, maybe after all, yeah, it's a test. It, it could have been could have been in, induced by aerodynamic forces from ice and un unanticipated, but doesn't have any effect, negative or positive, on the, the mission. They yeah. could have launched inside of a yeah. spiral column of air all the way up. Yeah, because that's a thing. That's a thing. Sometimes when you talk, false I don't facts. believe things that come out of your mouth. Well, it was New <laughs> Zealand. Hashtag false so. facts. <laughs> Hashtag false facts. You know, my, my uh, so the first launch was called It's a Test. The second launch is called uh, Still Testing, I believe it still is. Still Testing. Yep, yeah, Still Testing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, that was it, right? That yeah. was, uh, yeah. was common. Uh, so next week, uh, it's uh, Ro uh, Rhonda Millerun, mm -hmm. uh, CEO and co-founder of Interorbital Systems. They're a small sat launcher. Uh, we're having them on. It's going to be uh, quite a bit of fun, and that is Labor Day weekend for us here in the United States as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a s slightly extra long break. We'll have I think a barbecue. Uh, we'll ha uh, with, will it be a barbecue roll? roll? Yes, we will have to roll the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did there. All right. Oh man, uh, uh, you're so <laughs> predictable. <laughs> that's why. I also want to thank all of our ground support patrons. These are people who contributed between <laughs> one penny and two dollars <laughs> and forty nine cents to help make this show happen. Every single penny helps. Uh, we could not do this show without every single one of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. To help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. That's our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in After Dark. Goodbye.